Good afternoon, everyone. It's a real privilege for myself and Dr. Malafji to welcome you to our Tuesday Multimodality Imaging Conference today on June 7th. So we will be discussing pericardial diseases. Man will take over on the echo side, and I will be discussing how advanced imaging uh, can either be complementary or redundant. So, but before we begin, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. For those who would like to join by the web and participate with us, please go to pollev.com and enter in Debakey. Uh, for those who would like to join by text, text Debakey to 37607. Text in your any questions or messages you have, and we'll be happy to go over it during the course of this lecture. So with that, I'd lo love to introduce my co-partner here, Dr. Malafji, who will be discussing the role of echocardiography very important role of echocardiography in pericardial diseases. Thank you, Dr. Nabi, and, uh, and sorry everyone for the delay. We've had uh, some IT trouble. Okay, so I'll, I'll go a little bit faster in the interest of time. Uh, today I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about pericardial disease and echocardiographic assessment. Uh, to review the uh, pericardial anatomy, uh, think of the pericardium as a sac that surrounds the heart uh, that was created by someone uh, trying to sort of uh, punch a hole into a balloon. And as you can see, you can create two layers. Uh, there's the visceral pericardium and the parietal pericardium. Uh, the visceral pericardium is an inner um, uh, membrane with uh, some uh, elastic tissue uh, that essentially overlays the epicardium uh, directly, and there could be either fat underneath it or it could be directly uh, adjacent to the myocardial cells. Uh, the, pari the parietal pericardium is actually two layers. There's an outer fibrous layer um, and then the inner serosal layer, which is a reflection of the visceral uh, pericardium. Uh, between the two, there's usually, um, uh, there's usually epicardial fat uh, and then there's usually mediastinal fat or epipericardial uh, fat. Uh, the pericardium has uh, a certain amount of pressure that, it, uh, that it's exerting onto the heart. And you notice when the pericardium is uh, cut or um, uh, sliced that the um, actual uh, pericardial tissue retracts, uh, demonstrating this pressure. Um, so we'll, we'll go over cases. And um, here's a patient, a uh, young man with chest pain. Uh, you see diffused ST uh, elevations. And uh, let's say the chest pain is positional and pleuritic. So you've already diagnosed the patient has uh, acute pericarditis. Uh, the benefit of echocardiography is uh, first demonstrating uh, the pericardium. And as you can see here, there's uh, a, a heterogeneity in the pericardial space that uh, may suggest the presence of a small effusion. Here, the, you can notice that the effusion is not exactly um, a, a simple fluid, but rather likely an exudative uh, fusion and these are important things to watch out for. Uh, you have to also think about whether this is just fat versus uh, fluid and you know the presence of uh, the space that you know follows and tracks all the way posteriorly uh, particularly in this uh, clinical scenario suggests this to be uh, an exudative effusion. Um, an important thing to to look at is regional wall motion abnormalities of the LV to uh, assess whether there's any uh, concomitant myocarditis and this patient had a cardiac MRI that uh, further demonstrated this. And uh, to give you the short answer to the title of the talk, the two modalities, or the three modalities, are certainly complementary, not, uh, not redundant. Um, but with pericarditis, you know, the echocardiogram is often going to be normal. Um, but like I mentioned, there's, uh, there's important characteristics to look at. Uh, you can evaluate the pericardial thickness uh, particularly on TE, and this is an older study that compared uh, echo assessment of the pericardial thickness against CT, and there's decent correlation, but um, MRI and CT with the widened field of view and the ability to create uh, many more planes with the tissue characterization is certainly a much stronger uh, modality to, uh, to assess pericardial thickness. Uh, when it comes to the pericardial effusion characterization, um, generally, it's uh, is determined to be trivial, small, moderate, or large, and these are the diameters that uh, are supposed to be measured in diastole perpendicular to the uh, myocardial um, segments. But um, keep in mind that the the amount of the effusion in milliliters is not always going to correlate 
uh, with these. For example, if you imagine a shell of a pericardial effusion uh, surrounding a large heart, let's say a seven centimeter heart with, in a patient with a dilated cardiomyopathy, even 10 uh, cc's, uh, 10 um, millimeters of a pericardial effusion will be significantly higher amount uh, of fluid when that fluid gets drained or if it gets drained uh, compared to someone's uh, normal size heart, let's say a four centimeter heart. So the volume of the pericardial fluid doesn't always correlate with the centimeters that you measure on echo, but uh, these are generally the ways that uh, these are described. And it's very important to uh, remember that the amount of effusion uh, is also as important as the time that the uh, pericardial fluid had to uh, collect. So a, a fluid that collects very rapidly, let's say, uh, after a, an EP procedure or a wound uh, or post-surgery, uh, even a small amount that uh, collects acutely uh, can result in tamponade, whereas patients with uh, chronic effusions, let's say after uh, in cancer patients or hypothyroidism, uh, the pericardium gets through a model and the uh, volume to pressure uh, curve is shifted to the right where the pressure in the pericardial space may not necessarily increase uh, as the pericardium gets remodeled and um, uh, it's allowed to, uh, to contain a lot uh, larger uh, of a volume. Uh, and let's talk about tamponade. Uh, this is an easy case, uh, a large circumferential effusion. Uh, you notice the compression of the right ventricle during diastole. Uh, always look at the M mode uh, using its uh, very high temporal resolution to try to uh, establish the, uh, the inversion of the RV free wall uh, in diastole. And then notice also the right atrial uh, compression that you can see also during systole. Um, with pericardial tamponade, there's going to be variation. Uh, in this patient, you see there's variation in the mitral inflow. Uh, you can see that in the pulmonary veins as well. Uh, and then there's the dilated IVC uh, consistent with the high uh, right atrial pressures. Uh, let's review uh, normal physiology for a little bit to try to get into uh, this variation that we see with pericardial syndromes. Um, in a normal person, as they breathe in and out, during inspiration, the intrathoracic pressure uh, becomes uh, lower and negative, uh, allowing for the air to uh, come into the thorax. And these pressure changes are transmitted uh, to the pericardial sac and by virtue of that to the myocardium um, and the transmural pressure on the LV and the LA um, are transmitted concordantly such as they also drop as the uh, inspiratory uh, pressure drops uh, in the thorax. So because both of them are dropping concordantly during inspiration, the gradient that allows the blood to move forward into the left atrium uh, is unchanged. Um, in conditions of pericardial restraint, uh, whether it's constrictive pericarditis or pericardial tamponade, there's a dissociation between the intrathoracic and the intracardiac uh, pressures. Uh, the pulmonary veins are usually outside of that, whereas the left atria, uh, the LV and everything usually is uh, constrained by either, like I mentioned, constriction or uh, tamponade. And as a result, those changes that happen during inspiration in the thorax are not transmitted uh, to the cavity, and that gradient um, drops, um, and as a result, the filling of the LA and the LV is reduced during inspiration. And we'll talk about this uh, further into the talk. Um, here's an important case to think of. Um, when we're talking about pericardial uh, effusions and fluid collections, an important uh, decision to be made is, is this truly a pericardial effusion or is it plural or is it something else? So here's a patient, um, the ICU, uh, very sick with liver failure, uh, suddenly becomes hypotensive, and you see there is fluid uh, buildup mostly anteriorly here, and you see how it tracks all the way around the apical segments. Doesn't track down here, and you don't see much fluid here. You know, traditionally, we always have to look at the descending aorta and see whether the fluid is anterior or posterior to that. Um, but there is RV uh, compression during diastole. There is respiratory variation in the mitral inflow. Uh, so what to do here? Um, always, you know, as the, as, the, as the clinician taking care of these patients uh, and as the echocardiographer, uh, 
um, you have to consider the possibilities and don't sort of rush or jump into making conclusions. So the conclusion from this echo is that there are features of uh, pericardial uh, compression. Um, the possibility of this being uh, pleurifusion uh, that tracks anteriorly and surrounding the apical uh, segments of the heart is still possible. Um, so we need more evaluation essentially. But obviously the urgency of the evaluation is still there because of the pericardial uh, compression and the uh, reduction of uh, cardiac output. So when you look at this patient, x-ray from a few days ago uh, versus x-ray now, and you see a full wide out of the left lung. And as the chest tube was placed, uh, that effusion is gone. And now you can say, oh, this was a pleural effusion. But uh, the lesson is that large pleurifusions, and sometimes you can get right pleurifusions that track all the way down also to be seen adjacent to the heart, um, those have been described to cause features of tamponade and interfering with um, uh, myocardial filling. Um, here's another uh, aspect that's important to remember. Patients with uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension, usually uh, with severe artery failure, uh, the right atrial pressure is going to be very high uh, the RV diastolic pressure is going to be high as well. Um, when you develop pericardial effusions in these scenarios, which uh, is obviously a very negative prognostic indicator, you may not develop uh, right atrial and right ventricular collapse uh, because of their high uh, RV filling pressures. And in these cases, you can actually develop LV collapse and LV compression, uh, which you notice here of the LV and the uh, left atrium, which really uh, become underfilled both from the right ventricular failure as well as the pericardial effusion. Uh, this patient didn't need to be um, uh, drained immediately. They were treated medically and they, they were stabilized, but uh, left ventricular compression is very important to look at uh, in these cases. Um, effusions that are not uh, simple fluids are even more important, uh, particularly after cardiac surgery. You always have to be on the lookout for uh, pericardial hematomas. Uh, and this patient has uh, this fluid collection here that you notice is not completely echolucent, uh, posterior as well. And then here also, the more and more you see uh, of these echocardiograms, you become a little bit more attuned to trying to differentiate uh, simple uh, epicardial fat uh, from non-epicardial fat. Uh, it's not going to be always 100%, and I'll show you some more cases to display that a little bit later on. Um, but this is uh, very important to, uh, to think of, especially when you see the patient had surgery. And then you see here on the short axis view, you see all of this is pericardial uh, hematoma. Uh, patients with LVADs uh, in the early postoperative period are very sensitive to that, particularly because of their uh, heightened sensitivity to artery failure and their uh, predisposition to, uh, to getting even more sick. So this patient has uh, re had an LVAD done recently uh, now uh, has, an, uh, having, has an RVAD as well because of uh, acute RV failure uh, postoperatively. Uh, and you see all of this uh, surrounding the heart here, uh, as well as here, is also a pericardial um, hematoma. And that had to be surgically drained, obviously. Uh, always remember normal structures. Um, the transverse sinus, uh, and this image is, is flipped, if you will. This is the left A the left atrium. Uh, this is a, a virtual space that occurs posterior to the aorta and the PA and uh, tracks down superiorly. Uh, the oblique sinus is also another one that's usually located right uh, behind the atria and in between the, um, uh, the pulmonary veins. Uh, when it comes to pulsus paradoxus, uh, always think of other causes. So not everyone with pulsus paradoxus will have tamponade and or constriction. So patients with significant dyspnea, uh, usually you're going to see echocardiograms of young um, asthmatic patients who come with an exacerbation or uh, COPD patients uh, that come with an exacerbation and they're creating wide swings in their intrathoracic pressures. Um, and those can actually lead to um, uh, pulses paradoxes as well and variation of the mitral inflow. Um, this is, a, uh, this is a nice example of pulses paradoxus where upon inspiration, the blood pressure drops. And you see in this case where there's virtually no opening of the uh, aortic valve. And this is the, the, the paradox in the matter where you can hear the heartbeat, but you don't really uh, feel a pulse. Uh, always think of confounders as well. Um, 
when you're assessing for paradoxes in those who should have it, um, anything essentially that interferes with uh, filling pressures, particularly of the LV, uh, if someone already has significant AR leading to an elevated LV diastolic pressure and LV ADP, uh, or patients with ASD. Um, and remember that it's always a clinical diagnosis when it comes to uh, pericardial tamponade. Um, uh, this is an important patient to, uh, to think of, uh, an 80-year-old man with uh, heart failure symptoms, uh, prior esophageal cancer, uh, surgery, and chemotherapy. And the first image you look at on the echo is usually this one. Uh, notice the abnormal septal motion where it's not happening with every beat, rather, but rather with every few beat where the RV takes over the space of the LV. Uh, notice this space here where the pericardium doesn't sort of slide as you normally would see. Um, uh, I mean, the, the myocardium doesn't slide uh, against the pericardium as you normally see. Uh, and here's the septal motion again. Uh, notice the variation in LV outflow despite the uh, sinus rhythm. And then on M mode, you can demonstrate how the septal uh, shift is occurring, not with every heartbeat, but rather with respiration. So uh, this is uh, obviously constrictive pericarditis. Um, look at the mitral inflow to show the uh, restrictive or semi-restrictive pattern uh, of the mitral inflow. Uh, an important parameter, which we'll get into uh, a little bit later, is uh, diastolic flow reversals with expiration in the hepatic veins and um, the annular uh, uh, velocities on tissue Doppler, where the lateral uh, E prime is going to be low, uh, whereas the medial E prime is going to be uh, elevated or supranormal. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, these in greater detail. Um, this is uh, another quick review of the dissociation of intrathoracic and intracardiac pressures that I uh, alluded to earlier. Um, as the patient inspires, um, enhanced flow into the uh, RV uh, and reduced flow into the LV will lead to uh, the RV taking over the LV space uh, and the septum being pushed um, to the left. Uh, you see greater uh, forward flow in the hepatic veins, uh, and greater flow on the tricuspid inflow, uh, whereas you see reduced uh, E-velocities on the mitral uh, valve. And the uh, uh, pulmonic, uh, sorry, yeah, the pulmonic veins uh, will also be uh, reduced, um, whereas on expiration, uh, now the LV inflow is going to be improved, as you see here on the pulmonic uh, veins and the mitral valve, and then you see the reversal of flow in the hepatic vein, um, where now the uh, RV is having to uh, compete with the LV uh, for space. Uh, here's another case of uh, constrictive pericarditis. Uh, notice this uh, uh, echogenic structure. Notice how the LV looks kind of tubular and uh, elongated. Uh, and is not sort of sliding back and forth. And uh, you notice the same structure here uh, with the IVC plethora. And uh, here the patient is in AFib. So can you still diagnose uh, constriction? And the answer is yes, you can. Um, notice the E prime here, um, despite the variation and your inability or relative inability to determine things based off of this, uh, these should still be uh, valid for this assessment, and again, you have to integrate all of the echo findings. Um, the Mayo Clinic uh, study from 2014 demonstrated uh, to me that essentially none of these is going to be um, uh, a slam dunk for uh, diagnosing these. The ventricular septal shift is uh, very sensitive, um, and then you notice the variations in E uh, velocity, the medial E prime. And as you integrate all of these findings, your sensitivity and specificity uh, become significantly um, improved. But um, always keep in mind that not all patients will follow all the rules. So when it comes to e-velocity, for example, the description of 25% of a change that you're, you know, quote, supposed to see is not always there. And um, uh, for example, uh, and I'll show you a case uh, that demonstrates this, uh, the annulus reverses also is, in my opinion, highly dependent on the uh, location and distribution of the uh, constriction. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about these. Uh, the hepatic flow reversal and expiration, you can measure it. I personally just view if it's present or not. Um, but uh, 
um, uh, these are important to, uh, to look at. Um, here's a case that doesn't sort of fit the, the classic description, if you will. So uh, notice the paradoxical septal shift. Notice this echogenic area anterior to the RV. Notice how the RV is not able to move as well as you'd imagine it, it should. Um, e prime laterally, not bad. Uh, and this is a 76 year old. Um, medial e prime, not, you know, not, uh, not supra normal. And uh, for his age group, this, you know, could be considered within normal. Um, IVC, um, a bit on the dilate side, but with, uh, with the sniff maneuver, the patient um, actually has a collapsible IVC. And I remember this was about 2.0 centimeters. So does this patient have constriction or not? Um, and I've had this study come up uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, this, I wasn't fully certain that it's epicardial fad versus uh, something else. Uh, the patient had a recent pacemaker, and you have to consider this uh, to be potentially uh, hematoma as well. So uh, the patient had a CT. Uh, you notice there's an area of calcification in the thickened uh, pericardium. And then this space also um, was suggestive to be hemorrhagic uh, on the hospital unit's evaluation of the CT. Um, and the patient had another echo to evaluate. Um, has this grown? Has this changed uh, later on? Septal motion remains. Um, notice the variation is there, but it's not uh, that significant. The IVC plethora is there. So uh, again, not everyone will have all of the findings at the same time. And you, you have to really remain vigilant for this. You're better off you know, uh, getting the, the patient more evaluation or raising concern for it uh, rather than ignoring these findings. One other thing that I didn't show you here is that this patient actually has an ASD. So when this patient, in these scenarios with the ASD, you could be forgiven to not have a significant uh, variation across the, the mitral inflow. Um, although here you can see on the respirometer he's not making great inspiratory effort. Uh, so always think of these things. Um, uh, there's always an important um, uh, question as to differentiate constrictive uh, pericarditis from restrictive cardiomyopathy, and this is from the uh, early work of Dr. Hatley. Uh, the algorithm, uh, for the most part, remains unchanged. Uh, you have to demonstrate uh, the, the heart failure syndrome, first of all, uh, the dilated IVC, um, keeping in mind that if the patient had just gotten a whole bunch of diuretics, it may not necessarily have, you know, an IVC of three centimeters. Um, you have to demonstrate the uh, septal motion with respiration, and it's honestly unlikely if the patient doesn't have these uh, for them to have a restriction or constriction. Um, then look at the E prime. Uh, in patients with a significantly low E prime, uh, it's much more uh, likely to be a restrictive cardiomyopathy, but patients can have a mix of both. and um, towards the end of this algorithm, the recommendation is to look at the hepatic vein Doppler. Um, and then always think of uh, the young patient with asthma, like I mentioned, uh, who may have a good number of um, uh, the changes, uh, the mitral inflow, for example. But usually these patients will have a collapsible IVC. And if you happen to look at their SVC flow, uh, you would see significant variation uh, in SVC flow, uh, which you don't see in constriction. Um, so with restrictive cardiomyopathy, uh, the way to remember it is that it's a problem with the myocardium. So upon inspiration, as the RV is trying to receive more blood, it's going to be impeded by the impaired RV relaxation. And because the increase of uh, blood flow to the RV occurs during inspiration, this is where you're supposed to see inspiratory flow reversals on the hepatic veins, as you see here. And obviously, the heart is going to look <laughs> restricted, <laughs> and uh, the E primes are going to be low. Uh, whereas with uh, constriction, the reversals will happen during expiration, like we explained. And I'll skip this in the interest of time. Uh, this is another variant that we have to uh, always think about. Uh, this is a patient with end-stage renal disease, a prior kidney transplant, but now uh, with a failed kidney. Um, he has a, um, a, a large uh, circumferential pericardial fusion. Um, notice the expiratory flow uh, reversals in the hepatic vein. Uh, this happened after the patient had his uh, uh, pericardi pericardiosynthesis, and uh, his IVC was still dilated. Uh, 
Uh, he came back uh, later on with heart failure again. Uh, this time he had a pericardial window. And notice the fluid now, uh, which obviously has returned, um, uh, doesn't look uh, like a simple uh, pericardial fluid. Uh, the surgeon commented on the surface of the heart uh, appearing inflamed. And uh, third admission, heart failure, bilateral pleurifusions. Always think of uh, these scenarios with people with recurrent large pleurifusions or ascites. Uh, there's cases of liver failure who were also eventually diagnosed with uh, constrictive pericarditis. And you see uh, all the features that we alluded to earlier. And this patient has effusive constrictive uh, pericarditis. It's, uh, think of it as a, as a combination of uh, tamponade uh, with uh, constriction. And usually the classic presentation is someone who comes in with tamponade, uh, gets pericardial uh, pericardiosynthesis or pericardial window, but continues on to have uh, features of constrictive um, um, pericarditis and right heart failure. There's going to be also cases with um, either acute or subacute pericarditis that later continues on to have residual chest pain symptoms and uh, remaining pericardial effusion that later on develops uh, right heart failure symptoms or people with a known chronic pericardial effusion like the dialysis patient we talked about uh, who later develop uh, signs and symptoms of right heart failure. Uh, this is a good uh, example, a patient uh, from a few uh, weeks ago now or maybe a couple months back now, uh, 25 years old, uh, recent COVID but no other identifiable uh, factors. Notice the uh, pericardial effusion posteriorly, notice that it's not a simple fluid. Uh, notice this kind of uh, enhancement here, if you will, uh, but also the paradoxical septal motion that occurs with respiration, the incredibly high E prime velocity on the medial side, where it's 15, even for a young person that's still very high, the lowered one here, and then the respiratory variation across the mitral flow, and then here's the hepatic vein Doppler with the uh, reversals upon expiration. Uh, so that was a case of uh, effusive constrictive pericarditis, and um, this is a study from uh, Mayo Clinic where uh, they found features of constriction in about 16% of patients who underwent pericardial synthesis. Uh, the characteristics of those patients is that there is a higher percentage of uh, neutrophils and a higher degree of inflammation. Um, always think of these cases also when you see uh, loculated effusions or fibrinous strands within the effusion. But the prognosis in general is benign uh, if these patients are identified and treated and out of the 205, only two uh, patients needed surgery. Um, there is a study, uh, an older one from Mayo Clinic, also talking about people with uh, constriction despite a normal pericardial thickness. And um, uh, in this particular study, it was about 80% uh, of patients. Um, so always uh, look at the, the entirety of the picture. So echocardiography remains the first test and the most important tool uh, in guiding these, but CT and MRI can certainly high, um, uh, guide uh, planning for surgery and assess visa feasibility for uh, medical therapy. Um, there's one more um, item I wanna uh, discuss real quick, which is in this case, uh, this is because I promised I'm gonna talk about this, but now I realize I forgot to. In this case, with the, with the anterior pericardial uh, hemorrhagic effusion, notice that his E prime isn't as low as, uh, isn't much higher than the lateral uh, E prime. And this essentially, in my opinion, is because the pericardial constriction, if you will, is quite localized. So his LV is not necessarily as restricted as his RV is. And this patient, by the way, didn't really have overt heart failure symptoms. So he was, you know, probably early on into the disease course. But essentially, the lowering of the lateral E prime is really an anatomic uh, feature and for example if you don't have uh, significant inflammation and restriction along the lateral side you may not you know have this feature necessarily so usually all of these cases uh, are unfortunately discovered later on and it would be you know full-blown uh, constrictive pericarditis but you know uh, some cases may not necessarily have inflammation throughout uh, the whole heart but in this case just anteriorly okay so I will go back to the end, and um, I will end here. Uh, pericardial cysts, uh, Dr. Nabi was going to cover. Tumors, I uh, 
I have a pericardial mesothelioma case that I want to show, but it's the MRI, <laughs> so I can't show it. <laughs> Um, uh, really, these, uh, these cases really deserve uh, CT and MRI. Uh, pericardial cysts, you know, you can see on echo and you can infer uh, a lot, and usually these are benign findings. Uh, this is the last case. Uh, usually, uh, it'll happen in a patient with a technical difficult exam. Uh, an appearance of an enlarged RV and RA, a teardrop shape of the heart uh, is the, the term that's generally used. And this is a congenital absence of the pericardium, which is uncommon, usually in young men. And um, uh, I haven't seen anyone get into trouble from it, but theoretically and reportedly, you can have uh, entrapment of some of the uh, cardiac structures. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. And off to you, Dr. Nabi. All right. Thank you very much, Man. So um, I'll just get going. Um, so as Man has said, you know, really, when it comes to the assessment of pericardial disease, echocardiography really is the first line test. And that's because you get tremendous you know, anatomical information as well as hemodynamic information. However, there are cases where echo can be very challenging, um, and this is really where some of the advanced imaging techniques will come into play. And uh, I'll just add here that since we've been talking about pericardial disease, uh, you know, these techniques that I'll be mentioning really are, um, in my opinion, the techniques where you can really appreciate the pericardium in, in its uh, um, um, in entirety. So when it comes to CMR and CT, you know, these are techniques that have a large field of view. You can really image in whatever plane you want. They both have extremely high spatial resolution. And both of them are excellent, really, when it comes to visualizing the pericardium, the very structure that of the disease process we're discussing today. And this is our picture here on the left of CMR, what it, uh, pericardium looks like, and one on CT. And, I, and I, I'll go in more detail here coming in the next few slides of what normal and abnormal looks like. But before we get into that, just a little bit about the strengths of these two techniques. So for CT specifically, you know, it's really an, a test that shows anatomy very, very well. So anytime you have a, a situation where you need to see the pericardium or you need to do preoperative planning or you want to look for calcification, it's all about anatomy when it comes to with CT. Whereas with CMR, CMR has the benefit of both not only visualizing anatomy, but similar to echocardiography, also giving you insight into the hemodynamic process, the physiology that may be created by the abnormal pericardium. And one last strength I'd like to mention on this slide that you'll hear me talk a lot about is, again, the ability to do tissue characterization uh, with CMR, and this time not only of the myocardium, but here specifically of the pericardium, where we can actually assess for inflammation using T2 imaging and late gadolinium enhancement. So as we've discussed, you know, pericardial disease really is a spectrum of disorders. There you have the infectious and inflammatory type, You've got the thickening and scarring, which is a chronic constrictive pericarditis. You've got effusions. You've got masses. You've got congenital processes, some of which I'll hit on today and some of which you've already heard from uh, Dr. Mann. They may be isolated or occur as systemic diseases. And this is a disease process you really have to keep high on your radar when you're evaluating patients because they can be very easily missed. The symptoms are often variable and nonspecific. And it frequently requires several different tests before you come up with the correct diagnosis. So let's take a look at what normal looks like, um, and so we can I, then I can show you some nice abnormal cases. So here's um, what the pericardium looks like with CMR. You can see it's a very fine, thin structure, usually less than two millimeters, curvilinear, going all the way around the heart. A uh, couple of important points here are normally you'll see less of the pericardium infralaterally, and that's mostly because you don't have surrounding fat uh, to discriminate, uh, to differentiate it from, and also that, you know, the pericardium in general circumambulates the entire heart other than some patchy locations around the left atrium and the pulmonary veins. Now, Pericar what is considered an abnormal pericardial thickness, anything more than four millimeters is considered abnormal. And I'll be showing you a lot of examples of that. With CMR, we can, uh, some terms I need you to be familiar with as we go along with this talk. 
you know, we can evaluate the pericardium with multiple different sequences. We have our Cine SSFP sequences, which show you the movement of the heart uh, and can also visualize the pericardium. Uh, we have the T1 sequences, which help you to evaluate pericardial thickening and look for pericardial effusions. We've got T2, which is your water imaging. We use these sequences specifically for edema. And then you have late gathering enhancement images where we're looking for brightness in the pericardium that would then suggest um, uh, inflammation, which has been shown by histology. Similarly with CT, the pericardium again looks like a very thin um, a structure, again less than two millimeters circumambulating the heart. Remember with CT, we have two ways we can visualize the pericardium. Not everybody needs contrast. You can very nicely see the pericardium without contrast, and those are examples on the right side of your screen. Um, and then when we are doing contrast angiography, of course, um, you, you know, the pericardium is also readily visible. Now, let's begin with some cases so I can show you how CMR and CT both can add value in, um, in, in the evaluation of pericardial disease. So this was a 48-year-old. He had positional chest pain of recent onset. Physical exam was normal. EKG appeared to be early repolarization. Initial troponins were negative, and he actually first went in ischemia workup, which was completely normal. Here's a three-chamber and short-chamber axis of his heart, and I hope you'll appreciate a normal LV size and function. But if you look posterior and posterior laterally, you'll see an echo lucent space, which is suggestive of a pericardial effusion. The first point I'd like to hear, uh, uh, make here is that when it comes to the diagnosis of acute pericarditis, echocardiography really is making the diagnosis indirectly. We're looking for signs of an inflamed pericardium, usually looking for a pericardial effusion. We really don't actually assess inflammation of the pericardium. That is not necessarily the case with CMR. With CMR here, this is the same patient here. You can see anterior to the RV. You can see a thickened pericardium, which has some fluid in it as well. With CMR, of course, you are also seeing the indirect signs, the supportive signs. Here, the thickening of the pericardium, as well as the pericardial effusion. But here, with CMR and the ability to do uh, tissue characterization, uh, you can here on T1 images evaluate uh, the thickness of the pericardium and T2 images you can actually see the thickened pericardium light up indicating that it is very edematous. So you have the opportunity to actually assess the pericardium directly which is where of course the disease process is occurring. And then sure enough when you this is the same patient when you give them uh, LGE the pericardium is markedly inflamed and enhances brightly uh, with gadolinium. And histology has very nicely shown that a pericardium that lights, with, uh, lights up with gadolinium is indicative of uh, a lot of fibroblasts and active neovascularization. So here's you know, where CMR can definitely be helpful. This is the uh, European uh, guidelines on how to diagnose acute pericarditis. It can be very helpful in at least identifying two features, um, um, and the indirect features of pericardial thickening and effusion, and then a, you know, a direct uh, assessment of the pericardium showing the actual inflammation by both T2 and LGE. Uh, this was this, that, that patient was then on went for uh, treatment with anti-inflammatory therapy and was brought back for repeat imaging. And I hope you remember what you saw last time in the last images, that white uh, hyper-enhancement all around the heart has completely resolved, the, indicating the inflammation has completely resolved. The pericardial effusion and the pericardial thickness has completely resolved. And this patient, uh, you know, was considered free of their disease. Uh, here's another example. This was a patient uh, who had an EP procedure done. In the second group of images, you can see on the T2, you see brightness all across the pericardium. And then on delayed hyperenhancement images, you again see brightness indicating very active inflammation of the pericardium. Um, 
um, indicating active pericarditis. This patient was treated with anti-inflammatories and brought back to the lab. And this time you can see that the T2 imaging has actually resolved. There's no more brightness. However, there's still leftover um, uh, uptake of LGE in the pericardium, now indicating that the disease has more than likely entered a subacute phase. And can be, this CMR can now be very helpful in guiding um, the duration of anti-inflammatory therapy. So he's not, his inflammation has not been completely suppressed, and this patient went on to re uh, receive um, 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 a more prolonged therapy uh, to resolve, completely resolve his disease. Uh, this was a case of a patient who had a remote ASD closure who presented with acute chest pain after viral prodome. His troponin was positive. He had a CTA that was done which showed normal coronary arteries. Again, you can see here, uh, a, 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 you know, a, at least a moderately sized pericardial effusion all around the heart, specifically uh, posterior and laterally. And um, if you look at the LGE images, you can, the, the effusion is black, and the whiteness that surrounds it on both sides is the hyperenhancement of the visceral and parietal pericardium. So very nice hyperenhancement of the, both layers of the pericardium uh, demonstrated on this uh, CMR. But what's even more interesting is if you pay very close attention to the myocardium, you'll also see hyperenhancement of the myocardium, indicating that there has been... Um, uh, tissue damage to the muscle, and this is concomitant myocarditis in this particular case. And this is very relevant to be able to diagnose myocarditis with pericarditis because this is relevant for both prognosis and future treatment. This was a patient who was, 51, uh, who was 55, who was one week post STEMI, and who had a PCI to his LAD with position, and returns with positional chest pain. You can see again uh, a moderate size, um, uh, you know, circumferential pericardial effusion. On T2 imaging, you can see the brightness of both the visceral and peri parietal pericardium. But you can also see here with LGE, the myocardium showing uh, the evidence of the prior infarct. So this is a case of post-infarct pericarditis. So, um, you know, advanced imaging is not necessarily needed for every case. In those patients who have response to treatment with NSAIDs, colchicine, et cetera, they really do not need further testing. However, in those patients who are, you are concerned with, for example, in those who have traumatic injuries, those who have associated diseases such as neoplastic disorders, aortic dissection, pancreatitis, or those who are running a complicated course, with recurrent fevers, recurrence of symptoms, these are patients who generally you want to consider advanced imaging for further evaluation of the pericardium. So uh, this is uh, another case. Uh, this is now we're moving on to the more the thickened and scarred pericardium. This is very similar to many cases Man has showed you. This was a 47-year-old who presented with symptoms of uh, right heart failure, um, had evidence of uh, you know, volume overload, and had many of the features we've already discussed. We've, we can see the diastolic septal bounce. We can see the restrictive filling pattern and the respiratory inflow changes and across the both mitral and tricuspid valves. We can see annulus reverses with the, with the medial E being larger than the lateral E. And then, of course, with that, the annulus paradoxus. Plethora of the IVC indicating elevated filling pressures. And then a very specific sign of hepatic vein diastolic flow reversal upon expiration. And as you know, constrictive pericarditis is really a condition that is of a thickened, inelastic pericardium. It's really diagnosed uh, with, three, uh, on, with three conditions. Number one, you have to have dissociation of intrathacic and intracardiac pressures. You have to have elevated uh, filling pressures with uh, a restricted fixed cardiac output. And, um, um, and you, of course, with the elevated pressures, you have equalization of cardiac filling pressures across the chambers. Now notice this is very much a hemodynamic um, a diagnosis uh, rather than an anatomical diagnosis. And I, we will discuss this more as we go on. So um, 
in this particular case that I showed you, if you were taking care of this patient, let me pose you a question. What would you do next? Would you go straight for invasive left heart, right heart cath, despite the echo findings? Would you send this patient to pericardiectomy because you see evidence of constriction? Would you add anti-inflammatories? Would you consider more diuretics? Or would you consider further imaging? Well, I'll hope I to show you how further imaging may provide you further insights into the disease process. Here is the same patient uh, that I echo images I've showed you earlier, and a couple of features like I'd like to uh, point out to you. First of all, um, you can very nicely make out that this patient has a thickened pericardium. Uh, you can make act, act, uh, active measurements of this. You have a pericardial infusion both anteriorly and posteriorly. And if you watch the septum very carefully, you'll notice an S-shaped pattern, which is a respirophasic ventricular septal shift, a very kind of specific sign. Again, all anatomical findings that are supporting the diagnosis of constrictive physiology. What other anatomical findings can we look for? Um, as you know, uh, we are, this is a technique that can very nicely show you the structure that is causing the disease process. So the pericardium here is almost five millimeters thick, um, and this is actually also a very specific finding. Other anatomical features that we look for are, of course, this is a disease process where filling pressures are high, and you can see evidence of IVC plethora. Uh, uh, you can look for enlarged atria look for pleural effusions, hepatomegaly, and the presence of ascites. Further things you can do with CMR to support your anatomical uh, um, uh, diagnosis is you can actually do something called tagging, where you create a sequence where you create these grid, li grid lines over the myocardium and pericardium. And what you're really observing is the lack of slippage independent slippage of the myocardium and pericardium, showing that these two surfaces are tethered to each other. However, constriction is, as I, you know, we've both tried to make the point of, is that this is really a diagnosis based on hemodynamics. You can have thickened pericardium, calcified pericardium, and not have constrictive physiology. You can have pericardium that appears to be normal and have constrictive physiology. So really, physiology is utmost important. And CMR um, um, is a technique that you can very well appreciate physiology. So this is, um, you know, one of the sine qua non of constrictive pericarditis is the dissociation of intrathoracic and intrapericardial pressures. And what that leads to is some very particular findings. Number one is uh, the respirophasic ventric ventricular septal shift um, that is very nicely shown here, this S-like septal motion. And as Man has uh, uh, very nicely shown you, this is due to, you know, an inspiration decreased flow in the left side of the heart, resulting in increased flow in the right side and pushing of the septum towards the LV in inspiration and the whole process reverse in expiration. Similarly, uh, we have other techniques where we can also look for um, um, a, a ventricular inter respir uh, respiratory ventricular inter interdependence. One of the ways we can do this is with real-time CMR during free breathing. So the patient is, you know, this is live imaging of the patient, just like you would with an echogram to the, pa uh, to the patient's chest. And what you're seeing here is the patient is actively breathing. And as what you'll notice is as the uh, patient inspires and the diaphragm drops, you'll see the septum shift very subtly, but towards the left ventricle. And again, this is a very pathognomonic sign of uh, dissociation of intrathoracic and intra, uh, intrapericardial pr pressures, a sign of respiratory ventricular interdependence, which is um, uh, in the right scenario. Uh, pathognomonic for constrictive pericarditis. Uh, with CMR, we can also evaluate uh, flow patterns similar to echo across the mitral and tricuspid valves, and this is just an example of that. And, you know, using particular sequences, they were able to show the diastolic filling patterns and uh, the flow changes across the mitral and tricuspid valves simultaneously.
Now, of course, the strength of CMR, of course, is its ability um, in tissue characterization. And this, again, only adds value uh, when it comes to the assessment of uh, uh, pericardial diseases. So here in T1 sequence, you can notice, you can measure the pericardial thickness. On T2 with edema imaging, you can see the thickened pericardium now is completely white, indicating a lot of edema. And then on LGE, I hope you'll agree with me, there's diffuse hyperhancement or LGE uptake of the pericardium indicating a inflammatory, strong inflammatory response. And this in patients who have gone for, who have underwent a pericardiectomy, this LGE uptake is strongly correlated with a very dynamic active inflammatory reaction. Uh, this patient happened to have a non-contrast CT, so I, I brought this in to show you that CT can very, as we've seen, very nicely show you the pericardium. It can very nicely, as in this case, show you the thickening of the pericardium and really is the best technique to detect pericardial calcification. However, the caveat with CT is, remember, uh, constriction is a diagnosis based solely on hemodynamics, and so this would be not a technique that would help you with that. You could look at the IVC, and if the IVC was small and, um, you know, that makes it less likely that a constrictive physiology is present. So now that you know the active is, uh, uh, pericardium is very actively inflamed, now what would you do? Well, I hope you would agree, you know, none of us would probably take this patient to pericardiectomy. Rather, we would aggressively treat them with anti-inflammatories. And this is that same patient brought six months back to the lab. You can see on T1 images, the pericardium has com completely returned to normal in size. In fact, it's very hard to even see the pericardium. T2 imaging is now just dark. There's no more edema of the pericardium. There's no more LGE of the pericardium. If you'd like to compare this, you know, pre and post therapy here, I hope you can now see in detail as you see these images, how, you know, tissue characterization of the pericardium can be very helpful in making the diagnosis and in very helpful in following patients and mon monitoring their therapy and advising them on their management. There was a study that looked at patients um, and with constrictive pericarditis who had LGE and those patients um, who all reversed their constrictive physiology, 93% of them had a very intense pericardial upt LGE uptake. So uh, important note, not all patients with constriction need to undergo pericardiectomy. And this is just a slide I threw in there. You know, there's a, a lot of different professional opinions on how you can use CMR in monitoring the response to therapy, but I think we'd all agree that you can use it to help you guide uh, your therapies, when to de-escalate therapy, and when to consider escalation or prolongation of therapy in, in order to control your patient's disease physiology and symptoms. So here's another symptom, uh, patient with uh, 62 with right upper quadrant discomfort, lower extremity edema, again, heart failure symptoms. Ejection fraction is completely normal, but I hope you now uh, see something Man had mentioned, these tubular-shaped ventricles. It really doesn't look like the, vent the right ventricle is expanding completely. You see this thick-like ridge anteriorly uh, where, uh, you know, where the pericardium is. If you look, you can see again the, uh, the septal uh, 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 respirophasic uh, uh, shift uh, and the dilated IVC. So you've got both morphological and physiological findings supporting constriction. So again, I pose to you, what would you do now with this patient? Well, if you chose imaging, um, what you will note on this particular case is that if you look at the T2 imaging, you can see that the pericardium is very thickened. On, uh, on T1 imaging. On T2 imaging, there is no brightness to the pericardium to set, suggest active inflammation, and there is no active LGE uptake to suggest inflammation. So very different scenario from the prior case that I have shown you. This patient has constrictive physiology with no evidence of inflammation. So now what would you do? So I think most of us would agree that this would probably be a case for now pericardiectomy because we would not expect anti-inflammatories to help. So this patient actually went on for, to a CT 
um, because CT can be a very helpful tool in the evaluation of preoperative planning. And uh, what you'll see here is you can see this, you know, rind of calcium just really choking this heart and preventing it to expand. Um, uh, and, um, and calcification really represents the end stage of fibrosis and inflammation. And CT is uh, really, this is where the t role of CT is it can, in pericardial disease. It can be an excellent tool for preoperative planning. It can really help you localize uh, and, uh, and uh, monitor the extent of the pericardial calcification so the surgeon knows where to debride. You can assess patients' uh, a CAD assessment and graphs. You can really, in those patients who've already, this may be a reduced sternotomy, you can really help locate cardiac and vascular structures relative to the sternum. And those who may have had prior radiation for other disease processes, uh, you can look for associated, um, uh, you know, lung injury. So what about this case? This was a patient, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, again, right heart failure symptoms referred, this, this patient was referred for pericardial evaluation. When you look at here, you really don't see much pericardial thickness. Um, you may see some, a little bit anteriorly, but it's borderline. Uh, LGE, there's no pericardial uptake, but if you look very closely at the myocardium, you see this diffuse subendocardial hyperenhancement of the myocardium. So this heart failure patient actually was the result of a myocardial process, not a pericardial process. This patient actually has cardiac amyloid, and CMR can be very, very helpful in differentiating constrictive physiology from restrictive, especially infiltrative diseases. So, um, um, and so I really can you know, encourage you to consider adding constrict, uh, as, uh, advanced imaging, specifically CMR. Whenever you are uncertain about uh, the results that you're obtaining with echocardiography, as well as to assess inflammation, both to look for reversibility and to monitor for response to therapy. Um, we're getting a little bit over time, so I'm going to just hurry. Pericardial masses, you know, CMR with its tissue characteristics is fantastic at masses. Here is a, a, a very particular mass that's dark on T1, bright on T2. This is, can be nothing but a, a pericardial cyst. Uh, this is another thing that is actually uh, bright on T1, but dark on T2 with fat saturation. There is no other uh, substance in the human body that does this other than fat. This is a benign intrapericardial lipoma. Uh, this was a patient with a prior pelvic mass. You can see this mass lesion on the pericardium. It was bright on T2. It took up contrast. Any mass that takes up contrast is a tumor. Uh, it's a very important finding. We, uh, here was another case we saw in the literature. This was a mass in the right atrium going into the pericardium. This was a sarcoma. This is uh, just a, a case that shows you the difficulty sometimes we have with CT because intermediate atten CT attenuation you know, can be very difficult to differentiate. I'm not sure if many of you picked up on the abnormality here. You may have simply thought it was an anterior pericardial effusion. However, this patient actually went on to a CMR because of his depressed EF, and this is, was not an effusion. This was actually, again, a right atrial sarcoma growing into the pericardial space and, uh, all, uh, you know, with a very hot spot on PET. Uh, we talked about congenital absence of the pericardium, the Snoopy dog appearance. We know it can be complete or partial um, and uh, a very important finding. Um, and that CT and CMR, please remember them for suspected pericardial diseases. They are considered appropriate. I'll summarize by saying, you know, really echo is the mainstay. Uh, you can get tremendous information from it. Whenever you are unsure or need further characterization, consider CT and CMR. CT is fantastic for anatomy, can be very helpful with preoperative planning, the best tool to look for calcification. CMR, you ha have the benefits both of anatomy as well as physiology, and then also the added benefits of looking for inflammation that will help you guide with your management and monitoring of therapy. Thank you very much. If we have any questions on Zoom or any questions, I guess, uh, on the Internet, uh, we will answer them. Otherwise, we'll look forward to seeing you next week.